people are generally uh, sub subscribing uh, to the cause of traditional knowledge, but the challenge is actually to, to help them to go out from a naive view or static view of what is uh, indigenous knowledge. I, I think you're, you're, you're right in that. The thing is, is that since we're both anthropologists, we know that people have cultural filters, that they always look at another culture in their own way and through their own perspective. And I think one of the challenges that I always have is that people think about traditional knowledge as something that they want to understand through the lens of science, of modern science. Many people do. Oh, yes. For example, you often hear, in fact, I've heard the conversation in the last few days of there is a practice of a medical practice of people in Tibet or in Mexico. And we were able to prove by science that it was effective. Yeah. And see, this is an example of when people look at another culture through our own culture. It's validated only if it makes sense in terms of our culture, our science. Mm. So the point is that uh, the very process of validation uh, um, uh, gives a subaltern status to uh, indigenous knowledge because we take for granted that they don't have the means to be validated by themselves or these means are not recognized. So we take the cultural cultural authority of, say, biomedicine in that case, for, for medical. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, that's an issue that uh, we, we, we face uh, uh, in the field or explaining the, the, the people that uh, science is also uh, a cultural uh, production. Mm -hmm. uh, it's never neutral. There's values. There's a, a form of uh, morality which is involved. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, even the per perception of the world, uh, and then uh, indeed when you want to validate uh, uh, local knowledge through uh, uh, the filters of biomedicine, it's uh, a normative exercise which, which, which can be damaging for traditional knowledge, but which is also important when it's about medicine, mm -hmm. especially ailments uh, that kill people. What is, then what is, what is, what is <coughs> the answer? What, what, do we, what do we do? We, we need to validate it in, in some way. It's a, I find it's a very difficult si situation. I was recently at the, the museum, the Quai Branly in oh, Paris. Beautiful. And, and there's a one, beautiful museum and a beautiful exhibit right now, which is talking really about uh, the different ways of thought of different people. So, for example, the naturalism or rationalism of our Western science, but comparing that with totem, totemism okay. or comparing that with... Uh, with uh, ideas of, of, in fact, symbolism and how different cultures are understanding the natural world. And the point made was that unless we really are willing to try to grasp another point of view and cast off a little bit of our own ideas about mm. what is reality and what is science and what is valid thought, then we can't really understand another culture. And I think that's, that's the biggest beautiful. challenge that I have is that, that pe people find out, I mean, we all find it, as anthropologists, that's a little bit our practice, is how do we go beyond our own cultural filters and who we are. In fact, there's a big discussion about whether we ever can. Um, <laughs> but uh, for, for, let's say, the general public or for people from different academic fields, uh, it's very difficult, that. Mm -hmm. And there's the reaction that if not validated, then not appropriate. Yes, yes, yes. Science has its own characteristics. It's, it's a social construction that comes out of a particular historical era and a particular geographical area and uh, certainly a certain cultural background. But what there was a few years ago was the idea that we could really separate science and traditional knowledge, that mm -hmm. traditional knowledge uh, was a continuous, incremental, oral tradition that was changing according to people's observation of nature, that science was experimental, mathematically mm -hmm. based. And of course, when you start to really look at this, these oppositions, it's a false dichotomy. As I think you were going to point out, there's a lot of elements of traditional knowledge that we could call scientific if we wish to. And there's a lot of elements of what we call science that are in fact elements of traditional thought that oh, are that's elements of- very of, important point. Mm. That's a very important point. Um, Go back to validation. I mean, people are often not aware of how many 
things in modern science are actually not validated. Mm. Uh, they, they come from clinical experience, clinical practice, and they're not validated through the means, the gold standard of validation, clinical trials, etc. The one they want to impose on, 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 on traditional uh, uh, therape therapeutic knowledge. Yeah. But yes. A friend of mine who's an anthropologist, uh, Daniel Bauer, was giving a good example of that once. He said that uh, well, this was a couple of decades ago, but then when he went into the hospital, that he had to put on a coat you know, to be able to go in and see his wife who had just been given birth, a laboratory type of coat. And of course, he put the coat on in the hall, went in to see his wife, stepped out to have a cigarette or just have a break. And when he was gonna go back in, they said, no, no, you have to change the coat. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, from an empirical point of view, this is absolute nonsense because the coat was not in any sterile atmosphere before he put it on, <laughs> when he went in to see the baby, when he came back. But there was the sense, as we know, that the white laboratory coat symbolizes mm -hmm. some sort of purity, cleanliness, some yeah. sort of cleanliness, some sort of hygiene. Mm -hmm. And so there would be no scientific validation of the necessity to wear this coat, put it on, take it off, put on a new one, and yet the symbolic power of putting on a clean coat to go mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. a young baby was very strong. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've kind of given that up with home births and natural birthing and all of this stuff, but you know, it, it was one of these elements. It's, just, it's quite shocking when you think about that. It makes absolutely no empirical sense. Yes, yes, yes. And yet it's a tradition. You've been working a lot with am cheese. I did. That's your speciality. And, and, and there you find, for example, I know from work of other friends of mine that the Amchi, of course, know medic medicinal plants extremely well. Uh, they know where to find the medicinal plants. Uh, although this is getting, this, this knowledge is getting lost. Yeah, yeah. Well. Because, because it's getting specialized, institutionalized. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a uh, special, I mean, part, some Amchis are more like pharmacists, other like clinicians. Mm. Um, people who collect the plants for, the big institution, they, they're not even uh, traditional healers in any sense, they're yeah. collectors. And, uh, but I'm sure I'm working with in Ladakh, yes, it, it, it is still like this. And they, 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 know, they know where to harvest the plant, and, yeah. and above all, they know how to harvest it sustainably, don't they? Yeah. That is that the way that they harvest the plant traditionally is actually a sustainable way judged from an ecological point of view or a biological point of view. It is sustainable when, when, when they don't engage when they're not engaged in business. Mm. Because say, okay, I uh, would like to take this uh, aconitone uh, uh, and, and to sell it, then I can tell you that they go there and they take everything. Yeah. Uh, and then it doesn't, it doesn't become uh, sustainable. Um, for example, um, some plants, to be sustainable, you should not take the root. Yeah. Often, if you're five days in the mountains, you arrive and die, they don't. They just take the plants. When cutting, cutting it and taking it, we make the, the, the act of collection sustainable by itself. So yeah. um, still, also I, I, I'm not, um, I, I see both sides on the field and I don't uh, yeah, subscribe to the, the green uh, uh, um, uh, local uh, uh, person. You know? I don't want to use the term indigenous because it's a colonial construct, especially in, in India. Um, people became uh, indigenous in the eyes uh, of the colonizers, but uh, mm -hmm. um, so uh, local, local is perhaps more uh, appropriate, and um, they um, they're not green just naturally, uh, but they had sustainable societies because there were not many people because. Uh, for a variety of reasons which, has, which have actually nothing to do with ecology or any perception of ecology uh, in, 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 the contem in the sense that we give today to it. I mean, uh, it was just as it was and sustainable. It's very interesting, actually. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to romanticize that. We don't want to uh, say that people are naturally conservationist anywhere. Uh, but in fact, we found out that some of their systems of managing resources, well, yeah. some of their rules for governing who gets to access the resources mm. are in fact uh, leading to some forms of sustainability. Mm. And, but you're right, these are the things that are changing very fast.